Good day to you and welcome. My name is Dan Kern. I'm the Chief Security Officer for Monterey County and today's presentation is the fly fishing hack that cost millions. So we're going to dive right in here. This is the most text you will see today because I hate text on slides. We're going to talk about a review of the biggest year in data theft. We'll do a real attack and data theft demonstration and we'll talk about more tools and techniques to avoid becoming a victim. So last time we met, for those of you that viewed last year's presentation, we talked a lot about software vulnerabilities, holes in software that are ubiquitous, and that's the reason why we need patches, is to fill those holes. And it's those holes that bad guys use, and they create exploits to go after those vulnerabilities so that they can gain remote access to your computer system. We talked a lot about Java, the number one target, because it's again, it's another piece of ubiquitous software, and it doesn't always get updated properly. And more significantly, in many, many cases, businesses and departments they need to run older, vulnerable versions of Java in order to do their business. And the bad guys know that, so they pick it as the number one target. We talked about financial crime, how there's a lot of money to be made in this sort of a thing, and how it's organized crime. Groups of people who work well together, they're very knowledgeable, they communicate very well, and they create these things called online toolkits. And then they're able to make advanced malware available to others for use in cybercrime. We talked about how antivirus software is regularly bypassed. Basically, we see this a lot now where so much advanced malware is coming our way and that advanced malware is either brand new or it's morphing itself enough that traditional signature based antivirus software isn't seeing it and as a result systems are getting infected because of that. We talked a little bit about state-sponsored cyber war, uh, countries going after each other, and we talked about how some of the more valuable vulnerabilities that may not be known by the software manufacturers that have a high price tag or are purchased by governments for use in their cyber warfare activities. And we talked about targeted attacks, how the bad guys go after a particular target. They do a lot of reconnaissance work to determine exactly how they can either get someone inside of an organization to click a link or give them access to their organization or to a computer in their organization and then once they're inside they create they have a back door and they'll start to steal valid credentials they'll become you on your network and then do lateral movement they'll find the data the loot that they're looking for they'll gather that data and then they'll exfiltrate it and all of this is done like a snake in the grass the purpose of the attacker is not to get in and be discovered or start scanning on an internal network the average amount of time that an attacker stays on a network, according to Mandian, is between 200 to 250 days before they are actually discovered. In one particular instance, an attacker was on a network for over 2,000 days. It's about laying low and not being seen so that they can do as much damage on your network as they want to do. So, since then, 740 million online records were exposed last year, the worst year for data breaches in history. And while most of us can easily recall the big ones like Target and Neiman Marcus, what we may not remember is that a lot of other companies that we do business with or do social networking on were affected by breaches as well. But the big news last year was point-of-sale malware. What people don't often understand is, is that when you're checking out, say, at a Walmart or a Target or Safeway or whatever, when you swipe your card, that between that terminal and the bank is a computer and oftentimes that computer is running Windows XP and so the bad guys were able to put together some pretty decent malware to be able to actually grab and, and uh, capture that transaction before it was encrypted on its way to the bank. That having been said, can anyone guess which particular industry had the most breaches in 2013? And it is healthcare. Healthcare is the winner. HIPAA breaches were up 138% this last year. And one of the reasons for that is that with the advent and continued distribution of the electronic medical record, one of the things that's happening is while some institutions like big hospitals may have really good security and you know manage their data well, these records are also shared with a lot of clinics and a lot of different places and not all the time do these clinics have as good as security or even physical security where the devices are actually stolen from the clinics themselves. Healthcare 43% of last year's breaches, 
business including retail 34 percent and so forth of successful breaches last year 31 percent involved an insider someone who is willing to sell themselves over to the bad guys in order to grant the bad guys access to their network 21 percent involved lost or stolen equipment which include laptops computers tablets that sort of thing stuff that wasn't encrypted 76 percent involved stealing legitimate credentials and I can't say that too often that the the goal of the bad guy is to become you it's to become us and use our credentials to move around inside of a network because it's way less suspicious and 29 percent of last year's breaches involved some sort of social engineering getting someone to do something that they would not normally do also another big thing last year was what we call ransomware software that forces you to pay to gain access back to your own pc and the big one last year was cryptolocker and this thing when it was at its peak was encrypting you know 100,000 machines a day and what it did was if the software got installed on the computer that basically it would look for all the files and folders and everything that the user had access to and it would encrypt them so that the user could no longer see and get access to those files but the decryption key that was needed to see those files again was stored off-site by the bad guy in order to get access to that you had to pay 300 bucks and of course not everybody necessarily got that key back anyways so pretty destructive little piece of software and then of course we know all about the NSA they see you when you're sleeping they know when you're awake so here in the county of Monterey we had one half million intrusion events now does that mean we had one half million intrusions no or I probably wouldn't have a job now but the reality is is what a security team ends up doing most of the time is interpreting these intrusion events and determining if they are real intrusions and if they are then responding to those intrusions by containing them Within the county, we had 186 security incidents last year and 77 kills. What I mean by kills are machines that got infected with advanced malware that got past antivirus and other defenses. The machine was sleeping. This was usually caused by a user's behavior, either casual internet browsing, clicking on links, opening files that they shouldn't, that whole sort of a thing. And of course, if you follow the news, you would remember that it made national news that a particular security breach happened on a County of Monterey computer, exposing the information of 145,000 residents. And this particular computer actually didn't live on the county network, it lived on the state network. And it had been decommissioned and somehow got powered back on again. And attackers from Korea were able to breach the state network and get inside the system. And while they were rolling on it for about less than 24 hours, there was constituent information on there, and that required us to do the right thing, which, of course, is to notify those constituents of the data breach. So we talk a lot about computers being hacked and malware getting inside of systems and networks being taken over, but not a lot of us have had an opportunity to uh, see that in action. And so that's what we want to do today, is to do a targeted attack demonstration. And so today we're going to collectively all become the bad guys, and our goal is to get inside of a particular network and get access to personally identifiable information. Because that personally identifiable information, then we can turn around and sell on the internet, make it available to online exchanges, that sort of a thing. Now, in order to get inside this network, we have to convince someone to click on a link that we're going to send their way. And in order to do that convincing, we have to do some external reconnaissance about that individual and find out as much information that we can about him on the internet, on social media, that sort of a thing, in order to create a very specially crafted email that we hope he can't resist. And we'll use a very common exploit, in this case a Java exploit, in the hope that he as well has a computer that is vulnerable to that same exploit. So, a few pieces of information about this particular presentation. First of all, this was done completely in a virtual environment. It wasn't actually done on a real network, which wouldn't be a good thing unless you had explicit permission to do so. And some of the stuff that we're doing in this environment didn't need to be done in production, so that's why it was done this way. Secondly, uh, it was my intent originally to actually do this presentation live in front of groups of people that I uh, was doing this presentation live for. And there are a lot of experts in the security industry who do presentations all the time, and they said, you know what, that's not necessarily a good idea, because if something goes wrong and you're having to reboot a virtual machine and everybody's having to sit around and wait, it's just not worth it. So what you should do instead is do it and videotape it, and then you can talk over the videotape, which is what I did. In addition, some of the tools and techniques that I used in here 
those who may be out in the security community who are experts in a lot of this stuff may see that may, there are certain parts that might be missing or, you know, pivoting wasn't done the way it would normally be done in this instance. And that was just basically just eliminated for simplicity in the presentation, but all that's assumed that it occurred. One other thing, too, is that the tools that I'm using in this particular presentation are some pretty basic tools in the industry, and, and they're good tools, but they're not the same as some of the advanced tools that modern hackers are using that do a lot of the stuff that we're going to do manually. It does it for them in an automated fashion. All that having been said, everything you're going to see here is real. There are no camera tricks involved. So let's get started. Okay, so where do we go to find out a lot of information about someone that we want to socially engineer where that information pertains to what they do in their business what they do in their professional life and who they know in their professional life yes you guessed it socialengineerme.com LinkedIn and we're gonna pick on this particular individual here with the dorky fish picture uh, because it was the only way I could go after somebody real and not get in trouble we can see skills and expertise but more importantly here we can see who this person knows and we're gonna pick on someone who happens to work in the same department as him because we think that that might be someone who he may have a good relationship with in addition to that we also find an account for this guy on Twitter and what can we find out on Twitter we can find out what a person's interested in by who they follow we can find out a lot of things, like for their example, this particular person, we know he's into fishing and appears to be into the Eastern Sierra too, Tahoe Fly Fisherman, Mammoth Lakes, Mono Lake Committee, uh, Mammoth Lakes, Convict Lake Resort, Yosemite, Eastern Sierra Fly Fishing. And in addition, he even tweets about it. He's in Mammoth next week for fly fishing, Hot Creek, Convict Creek, next to home, favorite place in California. So we already know a person that this guy knows we know he has an interest in fly fishing. He likes to fly fish in the Eastern Sierra. So while this is only a start, the reality is, is we have enough information for this particular demonstration to put together a pretty nice phishing email. So before we send our email and uh, set up our exploit, let's take a quick look at Dan's computer. He's running Windows 7. It's up to date, pretty modern operating system, but because Dan needs to do business with the state, he has to run an older vulnerable version of Java and we're counting on that. So here we go. Let, we're going to create our email which we've done and you'll get a chance to see that in a second and we're going to email that off to Dan. And in addition we're going to set up our exploit, our web server basically that's sitting there waiting for Dan to connect to it. So here's Dan. He's doing his work and all of a sudden he sees the email come up. Hey Dan, you don't know me, but Dwayne Wood is a buddy of mine and mentioned to me that you're into fly fishing. I saw some of your trips on Twitter and noticed that you like the Eastern Sierra. I live up in the Mammoth area and just got off Hot Creek. Check out this beauty, the last picture on the page. Look me up next time you're up here. Wow, that's pretty cool. And as a matter of fact, Dan knows SierraDrifters.com. He goes there all the time. So what's he going to do? Sure enough, he clicks on the link. And guess what comes up? SierraDrifters.com. There's the website he's used to visiting. There's the real pictures. And the guy on the bottom of the page is supposedly the guy who sent him that message. Now, two things here. Number one, no fish were hurt in the filming of this video. That's true generally in the case of most fly fishing where it's catch and release. You catch the fish, take your picture with it, and put it back in the water. But the second thing is, what just happened here? And what happened was we sent Dan a link to our web server and his browser stopped briefly at our web server, picked up the exploit, and then our web server redirected him to the real site so that if he wasn't paying attention, it looks like you click on a link to Sierra Drifters and you end up going to Sierra Drifters. So back to our attacking system, here we are, and guess what? We have access to Dan's computer and we can actually interact with his system, we can get a shell on his desktop, but what we really want is full control of a system, and so we want to get an account called the system account. But here's the problem. When we try to get that account, we run into the Windows 7 user access control. You ever been doing something in Windows 7 or Windows 8 and the screen goes blank and asks you for permission to do something? Well, that exists to keep us from doing exactly what we're trying to do right now. So what we're going to have to do is run another exploit to get past that user access control, which we're doing at the moment right here, and sure enough, even though it claims that the exploit failed, this time when we try to get system account, we now have access to the most powerful account in Windows. 
So what are we going to do? We're going to start a keystroke logger. Meanwhile, back at Dan's system, he's tired of working. He wants to get ready for his next trip. So because Dan's tired of working, he's going to get ready for his next trip. So he's going to go to his bank account and uh, log into his bank and check to see how much money he has because he wants to buy a new fly rod for the upcoming trip. Maybe something a little lighter. And uh, looks around, sees something he might be interested in. And what's Dan going to do? He's going to buy one. And he puts in his credit card number and his security code, name on the card, expiration date that sort of thing. Meanwhile, back at our attacker's console, guess what we have? We have Dan's banking user account, his banking password, and his credit card, and his code on the back, and expiration, and so forth. Now, that's pretty cool, but we didn't come here to steal credit card information. We can use that maybe later to buy something, but what we came here for is to get personally identifiable information. So, we want to be able to do some internal reconnaissance on this network, and in order to do that internal reconnaissance, we need to become Dan. So, the first thing we're going to do is steal his password. So we run a little utility that allows us to capture his password hash. On every Windows system, when you log in, Windows stores a copy of your password in an encrypted hash on the Windows system to enable a single sign-on to work. So we take that hash and we run our password cracker against it, and bam, Dan has a really, really bad password. So now we have his password, and we're going to use that to do some internal reconnaissance. Let's start by opening up a terminal session to Dan's computer so that we can actually see what Dan has access to. And sure enough, we can get access to Active Directory within his environment. And while Dan doesn't have right access to Active Directory, we can sure see everything, including all the users and computers. And, and we can do a lot of reconnaissance work here to determine which users and which computers might have the kind of information that we're looking for, might have this personally identifiable information. In addition to that, we can also, of course, see all the files that Dan has access to, his home directory, and uh, those super secret security files as well. So, we've done our internal reconnaissance, we've looked around, and we think that we have found a workstation on this network that may have access to the personally identifiable information we're looking for. And yes, it's a high-level HR manager within the organization. One of the first things we want to do is log into that machine, and we're going to use Dan's account because we have it. So we're going to go through Dan's machine and pivot and get access to this system, which we can get access to easily. And now we're going to connect and take a look at what this user's doing. This user's name is Sue. She's working on an onboard document, as most HR managers would do. And what we're really looking for here is the kind of information she has access to. And sure enough, there's the juicy stuff. PERS, that's uh, Public Employees Retirement System Information. Health Insurance Enrollment. User Social Security Numbers. Database Passwords. All kinds of juicy stuff. But it's on a shared folder. We have full access to Sue's system using that system account. The problem is that, that system account doesn't have the same access to network resources that Sue does. Sue is the one that has access to those network resources. So in order to get access to those network resources ourselves, we need to become Sue. So we're going to clear the logs of any uh, trace of us having looked on her system. We're going to look at her process that she's running on, and we're going to become that process. And so we become Sue. And now that we've become Sue, we can execute a shell on her desktop, and now we have access to her shared folders that she has access to. And we're going to take those files that we saw, and we're going to download them. We're going to exfiltrate them off this network through Dan's computer and to our computer. And sure enough, we are successful. And we have achieved our mission. We have the personally identifiable information we came here for. So, we've seen a lot here. And the question is, was this attack avoidable? And the answer is yes. It was avoidable in a number of different ways. And we're going to talk about the different ways right now. Some tools and techniques to avoid becoming a victim. The first issue is patching. If Dan's Java had been up to date, would that particular exploit have worked? And the answer is no. Java would have sat there and said, I'm not buying this anymore. So having your software up to date on your system is a 
very important thing to do to minimize the risk to your computer. In the county we have a number of different tools that we use to deliver patches both to Windows software as well as third-party software and tools that we use to analyze where those holes are on our network in order to be able to patch them. I want to talk about what you can do at home because keeping track of patches and vulnerable software on a home computer can be quite a challenge. One of the first things you want to do is you want to make sure that this little checkbox here called Microsoft Update is checked on your system because what that does is it assures that your system is phoning home to Microsoft to get patches not only for the operating system Windows 7, Windows 8, Vista, that sort of thing but also for the Microsoft products that you may have installed on your system such as Office and Publisher and that sort of a thing so it's very important to have that installed one of the things that we do is we send out reports to a lot of uh, system administrators showing them a, a large number of vulnerabilities on their systems and they go to Windows Update and they run it several times and they say well Windows says it's fully up to date and so we produce a detailed report for them and we show them aha it's not the Windows updates that you're concerned about it's all these third-party pieces of software such as Apple QuickTime, Adobe Flash, Java, that sort of a thing. So how do you deal with this sort of thing at home? How do you assure that these third-party applications are getting patched? Well, there's a really great tool out there. It's called Secunia PSI, Personal Software Inspector. It is available free for personal use only. If you're going to use it in enterprise, you have to pay for it. But if for personal use only, it's free, and it's a really cool tool, and I'm going to show you here what it can do for you. So when you first install Secunia PSI, after you uh, let the installer do its thing, select a language, accept the license agreement, that sort of thing, what it's going to do is give you the option to either update your programs automatically, which is recommended, or download the updates automatically, but let you choose whether or not to update. Definitely one of the first two is what's recommended. Now, the first time you run it, it's going to check to see if you have that Microsoft Update checkbox installed that we talked about earlier. And if you don't, it's going to give you the opportunity to turn that on. Then the first thing, when you run the program, it's going to scan for your outdated software and it's going to generate scanning results. It's going to give you a system score and it's going to show you the programs that need to be updated. And if you have it set to download them automatically, it's going to update them for you. And as well, it's going to show you all the other programs on your computer that it finds and shows you that they are up to date. So another thing, if Dan had not clicked on that link in that email, would this attack have worked? Of course not. And if Dan had actually paused a little bit, taken a little bit of time and not been so excited, and hovered his mouse over the link, he would have seen that that particular link was actually taking him somewhere else, an unexpected location. And of course, if he had also taken the time, he would have seen the misspelling in the word Yahoo under the email address. So someone sends you a link and you really want to check it out, but you're not sure about the link. And you want to check that link out to see what the reputation of that website is. You can go to several different places on the internet, but the one we're going to pick on today is called URL Avoid. And you can paste that link into URL Avoid and have it checked against a number of reputation engines. And I'm going to show you how that works right here. So we're going to go to URL Avoid and we're going to paste in a particular website called beckandpartners.com. And we're going to submit that. And it'll give us some information about that website. But most importantly, it's going to give us a safety scan report. And any particular behavioral engine that has any issues with it is going to show up as a red dot. We can click on the red dot and see that the reputation of beckandpartners.com is very low. So let's talk about passwords. Dan had a really bad password in that example. But even so, anything eight characters or less nowadays, even if it's complicated like the one in the slide you see here, is crackable from anywhere between eight to 18 hours. And obviously the common ones are crackable almost immediately. Whereas longer passphrases, which are oftentimes easier to remember as well, take a lot longer to crack. Especially if password hashes are stolen from places like eBay and Facebook. The longer your password, the harder it is to crack. So what we recommend is passphrases, like this one here, where you take a, maybe the words to a favorite song or a line to a poem or something that you can remember, and then you tweak it a bit. You personalize it. You add some entropy to it that makes it something special to you. So it's not just that common name that could be easily put in a password cracking piece of software. So really important to use longer passwords. But the problem with passwords is this. If, if you know someone who is able to remember their password all the time, I want to meet that person. 
because it's really really hard to remember all the passwords we have to deal with nowadays unless of course you're using the same password for everything which is really really bad because then you expose yourself if it gets cracked somewhere else they own all your accounts so you definitely don't want to do that but one of the things we do recommend is the use of these password lockers and there's a number of different password lockers available on the internet both for free and at cost and basically you can store your password information in these encrypted containers and then all you have to do is remember the one password to get in which you want to have it be strong as well if you lose that password then unfortunately your life is over but if you remember it then you can store passwords securely in this instance and then be able to you know even copy and paste them directly into websites but the reality is is that the days of the password need to go away and one of the things that is recommended is if it's available to you to utilize two-factor authentication now it's not perfect but it does add a very important step every time I log into my bank when I first put my username in it sends me a text message to my phone with a code in it and then I enter that code into their website and then from there it allows me to enter my password and then it allows me into my bank account now, if Dan, in our example, had been using two-factor authentication, would we have been able to use his username and password to get into his bank account? And the answer is no. We may have captured him entering that key that he got on his phone if he had been using two-factor authentication, but if he got to the bank first, then that key is unusable after that because they're one-time password keys. So if you have access to two-factor authentication, a lot of sites have it nowadays. Google has it. Facebook has it. Twitter has it. Your banks should have it. Check it out. Generally, it's free. Take advantage of that and use that form of authentication. Also, it's really important to be careful what you pick up off the internet. Is it chicken or is it real chicken? When it comes to the county, we have a number of different tools that analyze incoming files, incoming binaries, zip files, all kinds of different things that come in off the internet. And they do behavioral analysis and we do event correlation and a number of different things with that information. But most people don't have access to that kind of stuff at home. So what do you do? If you want to download something from the Internet, there are some really good tools out there that you can use to help determine if what you're downloading is really what you intend to download and if it's safe. And Virus Total is one of them, and I'm going to show you how that works right here. So here we are. We want to download KeePass Password Safe, which is one of those password safes we talked about earlier. And it got a big button here. It says Start Download. So we click on it, and we click Download, and it says click the run button never click the run button see that file there that's an odd name for something from keypass so we're gonna save the file instead to our hard drive and then we're gonna go to our trusty friend virus total and from there we're gonna choose the file that we just downloaded go to our downloads folder and pick that file and we'll upload it to virus total and then we ask virus total to scan it and it says it's already been analyzed we can view the last analysis or we can reanalyze it and in this case out of 48 malware engines a number of issues were found by several of them including some riskware some adware what may be a trojan this is not the file we were looking for so here's a super important slide if you're working on a workstation at work that processes protected information whether that be criminal justice information personally identifiable information social services information health information whatever it might be do not browse the internet casually on that computer because so many of the infections that we see are attributable to casual internet browsing done on machines and if an attacker has access to that machine all of a sudden he has access to the information that's being processed on it. The same thing is true at home. Don't do your banking on your kid's computer. Keep the important stuff separate from the fun stuff. Don't do your banking on public computers or on computers where games are played. Alan Powler of the Sands Institute was recently interviewed by CNN and they asked him what's the biggest thing that consumers can do to protect themselves and his answer was brilliant keep the, the important stuff that you do like your banking and your stocks do that on a separate computer from everything else and have that isolation is very very helpful so definitely when you are processing important information tread very lightly and keep your browsing for business purposes only now stuff's gonna happen but one thing that we do not want to be is the person without the chair when the music stops and so if you're working in an environment where you're processing information that belongs to your department 
or your organization, it is really important that whatever you are doing with that information, whether you are forwarding it to your home email, whether you're putting it in Dropbox, wherever you're storing that information, that make sure you're doing it per your department's written instructions. Make sure you have a get out of jail card. In other words, if you're putting information somewhere, make sure you have written authorization from your manager or from someone at a high level. That way, if something bad happens, you're not left without a chair when the music stops. Really, really, really important thing to do. So look at what you're doing with information because we're talking about the information of constituents in our case and that information needs to be protected. Privacy of constituents is very, very important. So look at what you're doing with that information, how it's being stored, and make sure that it's being done according to your department or organizational policies. And remember that the loss or theft of that information could cost your organization millions and millions and millions of dollars. And bad things do happen. You may leave this presentation and go to your computer and accidentally click on something and go, oh crap. The last thing we want you to do is hide under your desk and pretend it didn't happen. Because if an attacker does get on your machine, things can get worse. So don't hide under your desk. I'm not sure what the people around you might think, but you can give us a call and we're going to try to be like that dog here. We're not going to say, oh, you just sat through this security presentation and man, you really screwed up. No, we're more interested in seeing was the attacker successful? Was the attack successful? And if it was, determining it and containing it appropriately. That's far more important to us than any kind of blame. So definitely give us a call if something like that occurs. We're almost done. Let's talk about personal devices. Devices like iOS devices and Android devices, which are taking over the computing landscape. I'm not here to bash Android in any way, shape, or form, but I am obligated to tell Android users that last year, 99% of all mobile malware targeted Android devices. Now, there's a reason for this. First of all, Android's an open platform. Apple forces you to buy software from the Apple Store. You don't have to do that with Android. You can buy it from a number of other places. But additionally, Android also is patched differently than iOS devices are. Apple forces patches directly down to the device. But in a lot of cases, Android patches are actually distributed through the vendors, through the carriers like Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile. And those patches don't always get down to devices in a timely fashion. And as a result of that, there are a number of Android devices out there that are in use, that are vulnerable. Vulnerable. So, how can you protect yourself? Couple of tips here. First of all, only buy from the Google Play Store. While it's not perfect, and neither is Apple in reviewing the code, generally they do a pretty good job of keeping some bad stuff out. But secondly, if you are running an Android device, definitely seriously consider looking at antivirus. If you go to AV Comparatives, which does independent tests of antivirus and click on the Android button, you can actually look at some of the different things that are available. Let's talk about the Internet of Things and then we are done. We're talking about refrigerators and thermostats and even toasters that talk to each other on the Internet. At the recent RSA conference, the Internet of Things is a big deal. And there's a lot of research going into the kind of stuff that's being plugged into the Internet, the kind of vulnerabilities that are there. And let's just touch bases on a couple of them. The first one I want to touch bases on is car hacking. If you're driving a car of a recent vintage, you are driving a computer. And those computers oftentimes phone home, and some of them even have wireless access points. There, there's a lot of research being done into the kinds of things that can be done by hacking into cars. But this is my favorite home automation systems. Yes, you can open your garage door from your phone. You can turn on your oven. And while this may be a small thing, hacking into one house, where the rubber really hits the road is in industrial control systems. We're talking power plants, train stations, water treatment plants, subways, airports, you name it. They have found that the control interfaces to many of these industrial systems are connected to the internet. And the vulnerabilities to these systems and the potential for bad guys to get into them is so serious that the United States military, along with a sand security Jedi Knight named Ed Scotus and his team, have built a working miniature city that fits inside of a room. And they connected real industrial control systems to the city, which allows them to do vulnerability testing, hacking, and research in order to learn how to better defend and protect these systems. Because in this case, if the bad guys got access to these systems, the line between computers and the physical world could be obliterated and much damage could be done. I definitely encourage you to Google Kinetic Ownage, that's spelled P-W-N-A-G-E, and check out Ed's slideshow and writings on this subject. It's great stuff. So it's really important to patch your baby monitor. 
There was a story last year of folks who had bought a baby monitor and plugged it into the internet because it allowed them from their phones to be able to watch their baby and talk to their baby from anywhere on their property. And of course this baby monitor had a vulnerability. Hackers got into it, were able to watch the baby and talk to it. And when the parents walked into the room, the hackers began to yell obscenities at them. So if you're going to buy something that's connected to the internet, do your own risk analysis. Also pay attention to whether or not the vendor that you're buying it from actually has any interest in security. It's a really important thing to do. It's interesting that the security industry now says that attacks are so sophisticated and persistent that it really is practically impossible to prevent them. Getting hacked is not a matter of if, it's really a matter of when. And what's most important is continuous monitoring in order to see the attacks and contain them. And I tell other folks with other organizations, if you aren't seeing attacks and having security incidents, you may not have your monitoring tools set up properly and may not see what's going on in your network. So it's really important to make sure that those sensors are tuned properly and that you are doing monitoring continuously. And it's important as an end user that you understand that you are an important part of this monitoring. You can be the human sensor. If you see something that's changed in your environment, say you come in in the morning and there's new software installed on every computer in your group, definitely make that known to your information security officer. Look for things that are different and be very suspicious about those things. If you see your account being used somewhere, that's something to be very suspicious of. We're all working together toward a common goal. And that common goal is, of course, to drink water from an internet-connected refrigerator. And this is my obligatory cat slide. And I will just say this. If you have not yet seen Breaking Bad, I envy you because you have yet to experience one of the greatest viewing experiences of your entire lifetime. And that's all I'll say about that. So thank you for Breaking Bad with us today. I really appreciate it. My name is Dan Kern. Take care.